There you go. All right. So, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming on uh, to the SMART series. My name is Bianca. I am the Events and Programs Manager at the Iowa City Area Business Partnership. And today we have Dan Wegman and Ben Evans from Rely on Insurance Solution. And they're going to be talking to us today about recommendations for hiring good candidates in a pretty difficult job market and then how to retain uh, how employee benefits can be an incentive to retaining those employees. Uh, as we know, that is a pretty big issue at the moment, not just, you know, in our city, but in over, overall state and country. Um, so this should be a pretty interesting topic. Um, and as I already let you guys know, uh, this is going to be a recorded session as it'll go on YouTube. So if you guys have to leave early or anything like that, um, I will share the link out and you guys can watch it later. Um, so I did want to go ahead and share my screen really quickly, which I apologize, I did not do since the beginning. So we have Dan and Ben there. And then I just wanted to really quickly thank Mediacom Business, which is our lead sponsor for the series and for their support of the program. And then I'm just going to share a really quick message from them. Oops, sorry. Awesome. So if you guys want to get in contact with me at the home business, we do have Terry's information up on the screen. You can contact him at any time to get in touch with him. And then also I wanted to thank our other sponsors of the series, which is BRL Human Resources and Consulting. We have the city of Coralville. We have the city of Iowa City and then Terry Lockridge. So thank you to all of them for sponsoring the series. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just kind of put it over to Ben and Dan to go into their topic. Awesome. Thank you. I will get this pulled up here. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining, guys. Uh, I'm Ben. This is Dan. Um, excited to be with you here. Um, there we go. Just as a, as a note, if you could uh, just please mute. It looks like everybody is. Uh, and, uh, but please feel free if you have questions. Uh, we want to make this as, as interactive as possible. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to jump in, put them in the chat. Um, we'll address them as, uh, as they come up. Uh, and we can allow this to be a little bit more interactive uh, with the smaller group. So um, with that, maybe just a little bit about our agency, uh, Reliant Insurance Solutions out of Iowa City. I uh, also have five other locations uh, throughout Eastern Iowa. So Iowa Falls, Kelowna, Muscatine, Victor, and Williamsburg. And uh, anything insurance, we, we basically do it. So from uh, home and auto insurance uh, to business, uh, financial services, group benefits, life insurance, uh, and, and anything in between, as well as uh, you know, a host of value-added services, both on the benefit side and, and uh, the loss control business insurance side, uh, claims administration, HR resources. Um, so essentially our, our whole goal is to be your, your one-stop shop for anything insurance related uh, for both uh, your, your yourself and your family, uh, as well as uh, you know, businesses you know, in the areas that we operate. Um, we're excited to announce we are 2021. Uh, top workplaces. Uh, we take great pride in that. We'll get into, uh, you know, specifically uh, how we are able to do that uh, and, and what we feel are important things, uh, you know, from a, a top workplace or that makes us a top workplace uh, and gives our employees, you know, the best employee experience that we can. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dan. Thank you. Well, one of the reasons we, uh, we put in that uh, top 100 workplace slide is, you know, attracting new employees is extremely difficult right now. And uh, we're gonna talk about uh, a few different aspects of, like Bianca said, the, the employee, I, I guess, uh, life cycle. So attracting employees, training them, working and what you can do to try to retain those employees. And then since we are in insurance uh, industry, we do have to kind of talk about risks associated with employees. So we'll talk about some of the 
pretty new um, exposures facing employers uh, with relation to their employees that have come about since, I mean, a, a lot of the exposures that's increased has come about since uh, the pandemic started. So just to get started, um, if anybody hasn't heard it, the, the past couple months be called this, uh, it's a pretty well known name for what's been going on, but the, they're called the great resignation. Um, there's some stats here and I've put these together just, you know, we aren't HR experts. We don't, we don't know all the ins and outs of everybody's individual business out there, but we know that if what you might be dealing with or what a business you know is dealing with, they're not alone. It's something that nearly all of our clients, whether Ben's talking to them on the benefit side or I'm talking to them about work comp or liability or drivers, um, they're losing people and they don't know why. And it's uh, becoming harder and harder to find people. So here's just some stats for you on what's going on right now. Uh, this is from SHRM, which is the leading HR association out there, but 40% of the workforce is either looking for another job or soon will be. So that is a lot of people out there, not necessarily, you know, for one specific reason, um, potentially thinking about it, a career change or a job change. That's a lot of people out there. They're current employees of uh, businesses or unemployed looking for a job. 4 million people alone resigned in July. There's a lot of stats on the past couple of months, but everything that's been going on is the highest rate of resignation, depending on what time period you pick, um, in the last 20 years at least. And these, one of the stats I found was interesting because I think a lot of the assumption is everybody that leaves is looking for more money. And this uh, research showed that 56% of the people leaving are because of managers or a company culture. So while well, compensation is a key factor, and if you've been trying to hire somebody and you maybe you're in a competition for that person, compensation is a, is a key factor. It is not necessarily the driving factor for everybody or maybe even the leading factor for a lot of people. So who is resigning and who is leaving the workforce or, or changing jobs? Um, baby boomers are exiting the workforce and uh, you know a lot, of, a lot of them might be leaving a little bit early and a lot, for a lot of people that could be because of the, the pandemic, everything that that brought along, concerns over their health, concerns over the new workplace. Um, for a number of reasons, baby boomers are exiting the workforce at a, at a higher rate than they were before. Um, the millennial effect. And I had to look this up because I'm actually a millennial and I did not know that, but I found out I'm very at the beginning of this. And I looked that up because just personal, I had a friend even last night tell me a job that he'd been at for well over a decade. He uh, is making a move to a completely different industry. I just, to me, that still was kind of a shocking move to make at my age, but more and more uh, millennials are willing to make a move. They're willing to change industries entirely. They're willing to kind of forego that 10 years of experience or the track that they thought that they were on to look for a job that is completely different um, than what they're doing. Or they're just more willing to move within the same industry um, for different reasons. But uh, millennials are now more willing to move. The Gen Zs, the impact of Gen Zs is being felt um, I think pretty substantially to uh, a lot of different industries. And there's a lot of them. There are estimated 60 million Gen Zs that will be entering or entering the workforce now, graduating from college or graduating from um, two-year colleges or graduating high school looking to get into the workforce. The interesting fact I think on Gen Zs that are getting into the workforce is more than half of them expect to do a job that doesn't even exist right now. So for them to be getting into a job right now where they feel this is what they're gonna do for the next 35 years, a lot of them just don't have that mentality. They don't even think in maybe 10 years or 15 years that the job that they're gonna be doing for the longer period of their life even exists right now. So a lot of them have, you know, for whatever good or bad, they have less loyalty or less desire to just find a job, start working their way up. So they're much more willing to 
the jump industries or jump different positions? I think the interesting part about this is I, you know, I, uh, you know, maybe thought it might be applicable to, to one generation or, or uh, you know, a couple generations, but to see it across, you know, not from the baby boomers all the way down to, to Gen Z's, um, you know, ha having this pandemic uh, affect all generations, I think is uh, just interesting to see because I did, I wanted to pigeonhole it to, to one or two, uh, but to see it, uh, you know, have the effect that it's had throughout all of them, I think is, uh, I didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, it's, we can't target one area to try to fix, unfortunately. I think that's what a, a lot of what we're going to talk about is if anybody was joining to say, you know, expect there's one website or one, uh, silver bullet type of solution to all this. Unfortunately, it's it's not uh, not out there because the reasons are so broad and the the, uh, the individuals in the workforce are looking for jobs are, it's so broad. But that's a little bit about who uh, is uh, resigning. And this was just a, to kind of echo Ben's point, but a, you know, attack on a little bit more information to what millennials and Gen Z are looking for. I just think this is, pretty uh, um, eye-opening the next two slides, just some research that's been done in 2021. Millennials and Gen Z, you know, a leading concern of both of those groups is their health. I mean, uh, I think a lot of the discussion out there is the younger population that maybe the health isn't as important, but a lot of people are concerned about their health. They're concerned about unemployment, but they're very willing to keep jumping, you know, maybe from job to job and they have um, some protections in there in between those jobs. And just, a, you know, the next slide also talks about mental health is a huge concern for um, younger generations and really looking for different things from their employment than maybe what other generations were looking for. Uh, you know, a lot of people employment was, they got their job, they stay at their job, they had the security there, and that's what was important to them. And then they're able to support their family. Well, there's a lot more factors going into how different generations are looking at their, their jobs. So these are some pretty reinforcing some of that, uh, those ideas of what different generations are looking for from their employment. So leading into that, why are people leaving? And this list is, I mean, it's, it's pretty broad. Like I said, if it was, a, if we could come back and say every person leaving their job is looking for 10% more compensation, this would be pretty short and everybody would know what they would have to do, but that's not the case. Um, the impact of the pandemic was of course huge. Uh, you know, people had time, they went back, they, they looked at the industry they're in, maybe they went back to, you know, took some training, they decided to change industry and they had an opportunity to, to go back to school or look into different jobs. Um, compensation still is a factor. And like I said, if you've been in competition with somebody, um, people are willing to pay. Uh, there's businesses out there with signing bonuses and, you know, offering higher compensation uh, for new employees than anybody would have thought of a couple years ago. Uh, Work-life balance. I think those two previous slides uh, kind of drive that home. There's a lot of push towards remote work um, and PTO, being able to take uh, time off and enjoy some time away from work um, that leads into the benefits. But work-life balance is more important to a lot of the different groups than it ever was before. Uh, benefits, Ben will talk more about kind of the, the employee benefits, but like I said, PTO is you know something in there that a lot of people were um, have said as a reason that they were looking to leave, they not having that option. Still some people are looking to leave for career advancement find a, you know, find a job where they, they know they can see a, they are looking for that long-term career path and they can see that within the business that they are in, that they have the opportunity to advance and grow and they're willing to put in that time. And I mentioned earlier, career change. There's a, whether it's because they went back to school, whether it's because the career they're in or the industry they're in just didn't offer the work-life balance. There's a lot of different reasons for this, but it seems like more and more people are willing to make a complete career change to a different industry than they, they were before. And last, I'll just mention there's, there's been a lot of protections. There's been a lot of ability for people to make that move. Um, unemployment has been 
very easy to get and it's been pretty substantial. Um, programs like the FFCRA, uh, Ben can touch on a little bit more, but COBRA, being able to have COBRA there to continue your health insurance when you make a job change. A lot of the economic protections that have been put into place since the pandemic have given people the opportunity to take time and, and maybe think about what they wanna be doing. We'll get into a, a track, but anybody have any questions? We got a, like we said, small group. If anybody wants to chime in on anything they're wanting us to touch on uh, with what's been going on that we've seen uh, in our research or working with HR firms, uh, what's going on out there. Yeah, I had a really good question. Um, so when you guys were talking about Gen Z looking for jobs that don't exist, what do you guys mean by that? Just industries or jobs within industries that uh, aren't, haven't been created basically. Types of, you know, if you're looking at 20 years ago, the, the amount of IT or uh, technology focused jobs or programming, um, the, the, the new jobs that are going to be created because of the changing technological world that aren't even out there right now. So a lot of them are looking at the change in, in kind of the workforce and what, what a job was 20 years ago, maybe in a manufacturing plant that's gone away and it's gonna replace with a job um, in a technology, you know, programming world that wasn't, that didn't exist 20 years ago. It seems like that, you know, that growth or that change is becoming more and more rapid. So if I don't have specifics, cause I, I think that one, I don't know the technology side <laughs> that well, but two is it's really just because there are industries being created at a more rapid pace where jobs are being created uh, that don't exist right now. Yeah. yeah, that was surprising how many people in that study thought about that and I just hadn't ever thought about that. So I thought that's kind of an interesting way to look at it. If you, if you became, went into sales or you went into manufacturing 30 years ago, you thought that was the job for, that's what the jobs are gonna be for the rest of your career and now, more and more people are going into a job going, no, in, in 20 years, I might be doing something completely different. Yeah. But, but I'm not and do you guys, do you guys think like the Gen Z era is just, a lot of it is because of mental health? Because when like, that also surprised me, like mental health is super important to the Gen Z right now. And so I'm just wondering, like, do you guys think that's also why they don't want to enter the workforce because they just think like sitting behind a desk for eight hours a day is just not for them. And that is probably one of the big reasons why as well, or? Yeah, I think, I don't think it's that the, the Gen Z's don't want to enter the workforce. They just want, you know, perhaps want to enter the workforce, you know, on terms that make sense, you know, to them from a work-life balance standpoint. And I think that's, that's, you know, maybe the key word that, that, I've heard over the past, you know, 18 months in terms of, uh, you know, what this pandemic has taught us is, uh, you know, the work-life balance portion of things. And it is kind of interesting to me. Uh, I think the perception I had leading into this was that, you know, baby boomers might have a really hard time with, you know, remote work and that, you know, uh, people like, you know, Dan and I in our thirties with, with families at home um, that I, I figured that, the 30 year olds with families would have a, a really easy time with remote work and the, and the baby boomers might have a, you know, a difficult time from a technological standpoint, but really it was reversed on, on that side of it because the baby, baby boomers had time to do, you know, whatever they wanted to do while they were sitting at their, their kitchen table, um, maybe more so because of the empty nest uh, that they, that they have at home. But, um, and, and it, ultimately, you know, I think the, the young families had a harder time uh, with the, uh, lack of child care and, and uh, you know, having to work at the same time. So uh, really that, I think that perception was flip, flipped a little bit in, in my head. Uh, but I think ultimately back to your question, it comes back to work-life balance and, and Gen Z's just being more, uh, you know, maybe willing to take less in terms of comp compensation um, in order to have a, a better quote unquote uh, work-life balance, you know, when it comes to, to, to stress and, and health and ability to do what they want or take vacations that they want. Uh, and, and I, I'll say live on your own terms, but um, you kind of, yeah, live, live on your own terms a little bit. Yeah, I, I think that's why I put those slides in because I, I think it's, it has to be addressed, you know, whatever your feelings are, 
however you take that desire or, you know, how, as a business owner, however you want to feel about it, it's incredibly important. It's important to the individuals. It should be important to the businesses as well. So that's kind of what I think that those slides try to articulate is um, there are going to be factors to what, when you're attracting, and that's kind of what leads into these is when you're trying to attract new employees and retain new employees to discount that and just say, I've paid 10% more this time than last time is, is not going to maybe check all the boxes that um, a lot of, you know, 60 million Gen Z's, that's a, that's a lot of people. And if 45% say mental health is their most important factor, you're only leaving 55% that that maybe isn't a, the number one. I mean, that's, a, you know, limiting yourself a lot if that's not in the, on the radar for what you're trying to do to attract and retain your employees. That makes sense. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, so how to attract. And like I said, if, if I had the one website, if I had the one uh, thing to do, I would have, I would send it out and we could all uh, just go that route. But what we're really finding, and this is with talking, I mean, it's, it's internally, it's talking to clients that we work with, and it's talking with HR um, recruiters or, or organizations the traditional passive methods are just not as effective. They call it the post and pray. Putting something out solely on Indeed and expecting to find the really good hires that you're, you're wanting to bring in is not as effective as it was even two years ago. Um, I mean, we can talk personal experience here with a posting that in 2019 would have had 140 submissions on Indeed and whittle that down to 30 legitimate people and you whittle that down to eight that you interview. Those don't happen anymore. You, you might put something out on Indeed and you get 12 total and you're whittling that down to maybe one person. So active recruiting is uh, kind of the key in this market. Uh, this is from Skywalk Group up in uh, Cedar Rapids, but talking with one of the recruiters and at their organization. Um, in 2019, they averaged 8.5 contacts with a possible candidate for a job. And today it's 11.3. And the reason I put that in there is it just shows it's taking more and more active communication, active touches with potential from the minute that you might uh, have somebody that you've sourced or sought out. It takes a lot of touches. I mean, the, they go as far as the day of an interview and you know, really making sure that you try to keep the excitement in your position um, going throughout the whole uh, hiring life cycle. So the number of contacts that it takes is increasing. Um, they need to stay excited and when they're not, if you see those percentages and if you've tried to hire anybody in the past uh, couple months and had them not show up, you're not alone. Um, 30 to 60% of candidates aren't even showing up for the phone interviews that they're agreeing to. And 20 to 45% of candidates aren't showing up for the in-person interviews. So if you have been ghosted, as they're calling it, you're not alone. Um, that's, it's just the reason that uh, this active recruiting process and staying in touch is so important is there's so many people out there reaching out to them or so many jobs available. They are, they're not applying for one and going through the whole process to see if they get it. They're, they have a lot of feelers out there and you want to stay in the, the top of their top of their mindset. And I, if anybody has questions on active, there's a lot of options for that. I, you know, I call it active because we're not HR recruiters, but there's a, you know, there are a lot of firms out there, whatever you, you might want to work with, but the, the, the key really is, is the post and pray method is, is not attracting the amount of people that it used to because there are so many people out there using, you know, active recruiters sourcing and having recruiting companies go out and, and contact people that aren't even looking for a job. So that, you know, that 40% of people looking for a job or will be in the next couple months, that doesn't even take into account the, the people that are happily employed that get contacted by recruiters. So that's, that's really the key of what's changed over the past couple months is the jobs, it used to be on the employee to look for the job. A lot of times now it's on, you know, jobs being brought to them that is leading to a lot of the potential change. 
So how to attract, use those active recruiting sources, um, but within, you know, look at your job. Is work from home or flexible work options, is it possible at all? And that's a difficult thing for a lot of industries. It's a difficult thing for us. We're, we're, going, we're going through it. Um, you know, our focus, we, it has to be on our employees and our clients. And we have to find a way that it makes sense and it works for both sides of that, that group. I talk about workplace safety, talk about steps that you took during the pandemic, make sure that people know that you, you know, that they will feel safe. We looked at that slide and health has been a, you know, a, for a lot of people, a very important thing that they've been uh, concerned with, whether they're young, old, in the middle, that's something that you should talk about that you've, steps that you've taken. Uh, and then keep track. If you've had two people for an interview and they both were pretty good and you hired one, keep track of those that came close. Stay in touch with them. Tell them to stay in touch with you. Uh, don't lose track of people that showed interest, went through the process, that just didn't work for that job. Make sure you have that pipeline for future candidates as well. I think one thing too, just on workplace safety is uh, in, in talking with, with groups that we work with uh, and talking with the Skywalk group, you know, one thing I think really to avoid when it comes to that is having a hard line on one way or another, um, you know, having trying to have a uniform, like this is how we're have, we have to do it. We all have to be in the office from eight to five, or we all have to be remote, you know, 100 percent of the time, or whatever the case might be. I think listening to your employees and hearing, you know, their concerns or, or you know what their safety concerns are, what their home situation is, what their childcare situation might be. And being able to be flexible and adaptable in those situations, we've seen, you know, be great, not only retention tools, but also, you know, attraction tools, uh, you know, for, uh, for, for local employers as well. Definitely. It's, I think at one point in a week, we had, you know, there were three people that had interviews and all three asked about different flexibility options. And that's just, that's the question out there. A lot of times you haven't, you know, do you have any questions for us? You ask a potential candidate, my guess is that might be one of them. And it's, I mean, there are, every industry can't, can't make that work. And they have to look for different ways to uh, kind of attract to your, your industry. So we touch on a little bit of training because there's a lot of information out there of people even, you know, accepting jobs, not showing up for day one, leaving so quickly. Training has been identified as kind of a key uh, factor for that bridge between you attracted them to your job, you got them in, now you want to retain. Got to look at that initial training, make sure that you're figuring out the best way to lock them in and, and have them be excited to continue once they get in the door. So initial training, try to make it engaging, have a plan that um, lays out the context of what they're doing. How is this going to impact that individual and that business? Um, continue the training. You know, if, if your industry is something that you can teach them in, in one week and then you, you let them run, that, that might be the case. But try to continue to have, you know, ongoing training, show them the different paths um, within the industry that you're in, that they have an opportunity for growth. There's, a, you know, a, a lot of people do want to still get a job and see the potential where they could be in 10 years. So you want to show how uh, your training out, kind of outlines that potential that the employee has. Uh, have checkup meetings. It's, I think, something that I hadn't thought about until we really started diving into this in the past couple of months is check in. Those new people have, you know, they, they have the potential to have a lot of insights into a business that they just started with. Maybe they're seeing stuff that you, you're doing that you've just done forever um, that maybe you don't need to or opportunities for improvement where they're coming in with a fresh set of eyes. Maybe they're coming from another business that uh, they can bring some insights. So have checkup meetings, survey new hires. How, how'd the training go? Did, how'd you feel when you started? And company and culture was a big thing. And I think you can do an entire seminar or a day on company culture, but are the employees feeling connected to who your company is, what your mission is, and finding a way to you know, uh, connect with coworkers? Um, maybe it's a mentor, it's you know, different, uh, different things that you can do to make sure that you are connecting employees to their, to what you're doing and their coworkers. And I ended here before I turn it over to Ben. Disengagement was a, a, 
not in that list, but it's one of the key reasons uh, employees have identified that they look to make a change. So once you have them and trained, I can retain them. Yeah, so uh, a, a big, you know, a reason for the, the disengagement uh, and things that we want to try to avoid is, is, you know, isolating employees. I think, you know, all of us maybe felt that, you know, from April through, uh, you know, call it December or, or even, you know, it, obviously into this year, everybody's situation is, is, uh, is different. But, uh, you know, I know certainly in April, May, June, July of last year of 2020, it was, uh, there's some long days for sure. And, and uh, the, the need for interaction, the need for face-to-face -face interaction, uh, you know, definitely very difficult. So, you know, just wanting to avoid that, uh, you know, if there is, you know, a hybrid work model where employees, you know, some employees are in the office while some employees are at home and then they flip, uh, you know, the, the resources that are available for the employees at home, you know, might not be 100% of what they're used to while being at work. So they're asking others to pick up the slack or, you know, grab the mail form, scan things in, you know, uh, you name it, a host of take out the trash, uh, you know, a host of, uh, you know, things that might end up on a small business owner's plate um, that uh, that can't uh, be reciprocated when you're not, you know, in the office or you're flip-flopping back and forth. So uh, we did see a lot of that and, and a lot of that fell on, uh, you know, the people that are going to the office, their shoulders, uh, and, uh, and, and we want to try to avoid that. And then, you know, obviously you're not, when you're not around your coworkers uh, and you're not communicating regularly, having, you know, check-in meetings or even, you know, uh, business-wide or agency-wide meetings uh, to uh, discuss good things or bad things or how we can improve, you know, people aren't being recognized for the, the good things, you know, that they're doing. So, um, you know, finding creative ways to either recognize them, uh, you know, at our agency, our owners uh, sent us, uh, you know, Friday gift packages, sometimes, you know, hand delivered them to our doors. Uh, you know, we'd have happy hours. I'm sure everybody, you know, is familiar with the, the Zoom happy hours. Uh, you know, I, I'd rather have a, you know, one in person as I'm sure we all would, but, uh, you know, not a bad second place. Um, and then, you know, along those lines, connections to a team and, and feeling a part of a team. I think, you know, we all enjoy that. Um, the, the recognition and the camaraderie that comes with, you uh, you know, doing doing it well and doing it with uh, with people you enjoy being with uh, is kind of the name of the game and why we do you know what we do. Um, and so those are those are the things that we uh, you know want to try to avoid uh, in terms of uh, you know disengagement and hopefully you know retain our employees. And along those lines, uh, just retention wise, you know, benefits packages uh, have, have been, you know, the reason they were implemented was because of, you know, to try to attract and to, to try to retain, you know, good employees. Um, and I think when we think of a benefits package from a traditional sense, um, you know, we're, we're going to jump immediately to, you know, health, dental, vision, 401k, you know, those, those types of benefits, and certainly those are incredibly important nowadays. It's what I do, uh, and I work with employers on a daily basis to, to do this um, and, you know, consult and provide advice on what the best carrier is to work with, what the best, you know, pricing is, uh, how we can structure things from an employer-employee contribution standpoint, um, you know, when it makes sense to look at other options, what other options are out there. Uh, you name it, we're, we're trying to, A, make it as affordable as possible, and health insurance is incredibly expensive, so being creative in terms of how our funding strategy, what that looks like, what the contribution strategy looks like from an employer-employee standpoint, um, those are all incredibly important things and conversations that I try to have on a daily basis with the groups that we work with. Um, but, uh, but yeah, to say those are important, uh, you know, 20 years ago, they were important. Today, they're even more important as we try to attract people because it's kind of not that it's become a, a, a box you have to check, but if, if you don't have an aggressive benefits package, it, it, it quickly becomes a, a way for a, a potential candidate to weed you out of, uh, you know, one of 10 jobs that they may be, uh, you know, entertaining at the moment. So, um, if there's any questions in terms of benefits packages from a traditional sense, obviously, uh, you know, happy to consult on, uh, on on any of those products or policies that, that you may have. Um, and uh, and we can talk specifically more about those, uh, you know, offline. Highlighting your benefit package for your employees, because I work in an insurance agency and I, I have to ask a lot of times what some of our, because 
I just kind of check out and I think it's important for um, employers. It's good to yeah. highlight it. You guys are, if you have benefits, you're investing in that, you're making those available and they are very beneficial to what your employees are receiving. So, right. I think the, the, the important part is, yeah, exactly right. Uh, is to, is whatever you're doing is to promote that. Right. Uh, and whether that's promoting it in a way that, uh, from a, from a handout standpoint or an information standpoint, sometimes employees hear a percentage in terms of what the employer pays of, you know, call it 70, 80, 90% of the employee, uh, you know, health insurance premium, but they don't really have an idea of what that dollar amount is, you know, and, and I think sometimes it's helpful to, you know, just put a dollar amount on, you know, what that actually looks like. And from a monthly standpoint, what is the employer paying versus what is the employee paying? Um, cause I think it, it just became so old hat to, to say we cover 90%. Well, that's a substantial amount of money, uh, you know, for an employer to cover on your behalf. Uh, and, and while we don't want it to become routine, um, you know, we certainly want to highlight and, and scream that from the rooftops if we can, uh, you know, in the hopes of, uh, attracting and retaining, you know, the best talent we can. Um, so from a, a, a non-traditional benefits package, you know, we spoke about this earlier, but um, back to Dan's point about whatever we're doing, what, it, whether it's unique or whether it's, uh, you know, something that, you know, somebody else might not do, or whatever the case might be, we, we want to make sure we're promoting that, we're screaming that from the rooftops and, and making sure that everybody knows, uh, because ultimately that's how we're going to distance ourselves from, uh, you know, potential, I'll say, competition uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, hiring people from uh, like industries. So um, from a non-traditional benefits package, uh, work-life balance is, is incredibly important. What does your model look like? Is it hybrid? Is it 100% work from the office? Is it 100% work from home? Is it flexible? Uh, you know, what do the resources look like behind, uh, you know, being able to work at home? Do you have a laptop? Do you have monitors? Do you have uh, a VPN to log in through? You know, just explaining, you know, the, the steps that you've taken as an employer, if that's part of the, the package that you offer, uh, to try to make it as seamless as possible for your employees to work wherever it might be, whether that's at a Starbucks downtown or, or their you know, living room uh, at their kitchen table, whatever the case might be. Um, wellness incentives are, are uh, you know, something that's growing popularity. And, and from a wellness incentive standpoint, I don't mean like a formal wellness program, uh, well, that's certainly something that, that, that we can offer as well um, and uh, have many groups that take advantage of that, you know, from, a, from an actual wellness vendor and a wellness platform. Uh, these are more informal programs that help engage employees. Um, and so whether that's, you know, uh, you know meeting for uh, a, a, a walk at lunch or uh, a group that goes for a walk at lunch or, uh, you know, volunteering for uh, Habitat for Humanity. Uh, or, you know, whatever the case might be, being active in the community uh, and doing that together, I think is something that uh, has grown in popularity, you know, especially over the, the last 18 months when we couldn't do it uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and then finally, you know, the, the work perks, we like to call them. Uh, so this, this could have a variety of different uh, ranges and things that you could, you could put on this. Um, we actually did a handout for our agency just in terms of all of them. And it was actually helpful to, to put them down on a piece of paper because for so long we've had, we've had dry cleaning come to the office or we've had, uh, you know, a car service that, you know, we partnered with a, a, a auto dealer here in town to have, uh, you know, oil change shuttle back and forth. You know, so like little things like that, um, early out Fridays, walking meetings, casual dress code. Uh, I, I spoke about dry cleaning, so just whatever it is, just putting it down on paper and, and, uh, and letting either your employees or your potential employees know, you know, here are some things that don't cost you anything that you just get for, you know, being an employee here. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a helpful, helpful exercise. I would imagine that uh, there's uh, some things you could put down right now without even having to think about it. Uh, and certainly if you needed some ideas or wanted some ideas, we could, uh, you know, help on that as well. But the bottom line is the more ways you can differentiate yourself, the better it's going to be. And whatever makes you unique, that you we have to be screaming that from the rooftops. Um, and then finally, just Dan hit on this just in terms of career path as well, but just a clear path of succession, uh, you know, if desire. And I, um, I think that that's a key word as well. Not everybody has a desire to be the president of the company. 
Um, you know, some people, you know, want that clear path. Here's what it takes. Here's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come in at, um, you know, position X. And if I do what I'm asked to do, I'll, you know, gradually work my way up uh, to whatever that desired position could be. Um, but I think having that clear path is important, especially for the Gen Z, you know, generation, because uh, they want to know, uh, you know, what, what are the measurable things that I need to do in order to get there? And they want to see that path for the next, you know, five to 10 years uh, of where they, you know, potentially could be if they hit all their goals. So we want to do this through performance evaluations. You know, those are, those are becoming more frequent as opposed to, you know, it used to be a, a, an annual deal. Uh, quarterly is, is now uh, kind of the standard in terms of performance evaluations and a, a, in a less formal, informal manner, I should say. Um, so making sure that it's more of just a check-in, here's, you know, here's our quarterly goals, here's what we, you know, how we performed on those. Um, having coaching sessions throughout those. Uh, so, you know, instead of, uh, you know, the annual meeting, again, just trying to say, hey, here's, here's what you did good. Here's what you, did, you know, didn't do so good. Um, let's work on those. Uh, and, uh, you know, finally, I think I hit on this too, but don't assume that everybody uh, that starts a job has the same career goals or aspirations. So, you know, maybe they don't want to be a manager. Maybe they just want to stay, uh, you know, where they're at. Maybe they do want to be a manager, um, you know, so just knowing that, knowing your employees and, and having a plan for them, uh, ultimately, I think is going to help your retention rate uh, because your employees are going to be happier. Well, I'm going to kind of end with the bad stuff, what not to do. And these are all leading to kind of things that we have seen grow from an insurance standpoint. And we say there's risk to having employees. It's because there is a risk to the business uh, for having employees, if, if you do something that they perceive as wrong and there's avenues for them to try to penalize or come back after the business. So Ben mentioned hardline decisions without educating the employees for the reason. So if your business just cannot do a work from home, there, you know, have the discussions on what that reason is. Um, if you're making a decision related to COVID protocols or safety protocols, make sure that you are educating and having an open dialogue with your employees on the reasons for that. Of course, I think, I mean, I put it on there, I think everybody, nobody probably does this intentionally, but don't make them feel expendable. Um, leading to that is those post and pray websites, having blanket uh, job postings out there that are just out there for eternity leads to employees feeling like what they're doing is not appreciated or they're expendable at any time. And, a big key that, and these, and these can be hard because there's different job duties within different, uh, you know, levels or, or types of jobs within a business, but making accommodations for leaders, uh, more accommodations for leaders, but stricter uh, requirements and expectations for the frontline workers. That's been, if anything in the pandemic has been highlighted because maybe some jobs could be done more easily remotely and others couldn't, well, without that open discussion, that just looks like favorable, you know, to the, the top people in the company and is a pretty uh, bad feeling to be if you're a frontline worker. So what the result of some of, you know, the, the new compliance or some of the actions taken over the past couple, uh, 18 months or so, there's been far more compliance to deal with. You've had to handle I mean, new regulations that came out within weeks and you had to know and understand those. And so with more compliance, it leads to more exposure to the business. And in insurance, we call them um, employment practices, liability claims, but really these are Iowa civil rights uh, or claims to the EEOC um, that they make a claim against you for a variety of protected reasons. And I have a, a list here, and this is just, a, I mean, this is from a Forbes article. Forbes called COVID the perfect workplace agitator and that it affects everyone. And these were some of the claims that they, I mean, actual claims that in this Forbes article that they pulled out, but an employee alleging inadequate workplace policies and safety that led them to getting COVID. They file a claim for that. Um, employers contact tracing efforts re released uh, protected information. Um, an employee that alleges retaliation after being discharged because they refused to comply. Um, and it goes on and on. Uh, 
an employer or a group of employees file a claim against their employer for misrepresenting the severity. So trying to hide the information that was out there from their employees. Um, and, and there's a lot, you know, businesses that had to furlough or lay off people during difficult times. That is a, it's a disruption to the business. It's a, you know, a life changing situation to an employee. And when these situations happen, there are more protections for employees than there have been in the past. And then filing an employment practices claim can be a very difficult process to go through and a very expensive process to go through. And a lot of times these are employee leaning judgments. They're looking out for employees over the employer. So they can be expensive situations to go through. Uh, OSHA complaints, we have seen more just in our office and I cannot imagine it's not state and nationwide. We have seen more OSHA complaints against employers in the last 18 months than our loss control uh, specialist. She's been in it for 10 years. She has handled more in the 18 months than she did in 10 years prior. Um, and it's for a, a lot of reasons, but there have been more complaints filed against OSHA. And these aren't construction companies that are getting these complaints. These are medical offices. These are nonprofits. These are every type of business. Um, we've seen an uptick in employees making complaints again to OSHA against their employer. And then lastly, I just want to say, you know, safety concerns. We, I deal with work comp. When we have employees that are stretched thin because um, they are, you know, you can't hire as many people, they're working overtime. Maybe you've had to shift them to doing different duties. There are definite safety concerns with, uh, with doing that, depending on what your industry is. But you, you have overworked employees. They're not as safe as when they're rested and, and ready to go. Uh, employees thrown into a new job that they're not, they're not comfortable with, they haven't been fully trained on, and then rushing those trainings. So those are some of the, the risks that, from an insurance standpoint, that we have been seeing increasing a lot over the past 18 months. So that's what we've got. We've got uh, some time. It looks like there are any questions. Yeah, I think there's some questions in the chat for you guys. Okay. Can you see them or would you like me yeah, to read them? Let's just read. Yeah, let's just read. Yep. So we've got nonprofit. Yeah. So, so yeah. So the question is, what retaining incentives would you recommend for nonprofit groups who might not have uh, much money, uh, resources to provide their employees with gifts, etc.? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. It's certainly something we could, uh, you know, speak more, more to, um, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, just to get a better idea of maybe, you know, what do your employees value? I, I would look at that. Um, you know, where, where do you think it would have the most impact? I think, you know, an increased contribution to, uh, to the health insurance, uh, you know, is always a, a good place to start. Um, you know, just doing, doing something in the office, I think, in, in terms of just recognizing them, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, good work that they've done. Um, it doesn't have to be within a big elaborate gift, uh, but just, you know, recognition amongst their peers, I think goes a long way. Um, so yeah, certainly something we, we could discuss more and happy to talk, uh, you know, more on, a, on an individual basis as well, just to get a better idea of, you know, what, what your business is and, and what your employees might value. I think that's the key is uh, it's hard. I mean, the, the money, that, and we say with compensation, it's, I mean, every, every business can't just start paying more. It's trying to identify, you know, we've done, when we we're going through that top 100 survey, we, we surveyed every employee, what, and try to identify, you know, different areas that we can improve, you know, recognition came up a lot. Appreciation is always a key factor in how they like to be shown appreciation. Um, I, th I think it is a, you know, not everybody can just say, I mean, everybody's not Facebook that just can say, here's, you know, here's a $5,000 for being with us uh, bonus. So right. um, the incentives have to be more targeted to, you know, open discussions, maybe it's just, you know, uh, trying to highlight the value of their work too, I think in a nonprofit would be very, you know, important celebrating the wins of what you guys, what you guys do. Right. I think that's a, you know, giving them all the ability that they can to buy into what the mission is and find value in what they're doing. And not everybody's out yet yeah, wants necessarily more compensation, but if they 
are looking for more compensation and don't find value or connection to what yeah. the work they're doing. That's where you're going to have to shift. It's, it's a harder, harder retention. I think the other, the other piece too, just in terms of, we talk about internal, uh, you know, recognition, external recognition is, is great as well. You know, whether it's via social media, you know, highlighting an employee, you know, doing an employee spotlight, saying the great work that they do in a more outwardly facing manner, uh, you know, is, is great as well. So I think, you know, recognition amongst your peers is great. Recognition amongst, uh, you know, people on the outside is, is good too. Um, but certainly, you know, our, our, uh, our contact information will, will be, uh, you know, available after this. I, I'd, I'd love to, you know, connect more on that and, uh, you know, get to know maybe the, the, the nonprofit and the, uh, employee a little bit better and, in, in, uh, in hopes of understanding and coming up with a good solution there. And the other question on there, how do you suggest adapting these strategies for hourly or frontline employees or part-time employees? I guess it, it depends on, you know, the, the strategy. I, I think, you know, sometimes the, I mean, some, those are just as hard a position sometimes to fill as other ones and, and they maybe aren't eligible for the traditional benefits, but if you can bring them into some of the, um, some of the other benefits that, you know, if you, if you give the afternoon off, maybe you do give them a PTO, uh, maybe you do give them that paid half day off, um, definitely partaking in any of the incentive get togethers. If, you know, you're doing a happy hour, some of those pieces, but I, I don't, I'm not sure specifically what's, uh, the strategies, but I yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I think that's where your workplace culture is really going to have to play a big part in it just because it's not you know, the, the traditional benefits packages isn't going to, you know, maybe be relevant for, for uh, you know, part-time employees uh, or, or hourly employees. So really, you know, just relying on the culture that you build in terms of, you know, fun, positive, uplifting, you know, a place where people want to work, uh, you know, making it clean, making it safe uh, and, and, you know, promoting those sorts of things to the, to the best ability that you can. Um, you know, I think that's, that's going to be a, a huge thing for, for those types of employees to fall back on and employers of those employees to fall back on. And I wonder if, I mean, maybe there's some of that, uh, you know, that point of the managers or admin, different type of, uh, duties being held or frontline employees being held to a different standard than maybe some of the other ones. Maybe that's an area where if you can look at some of the perks that aren't, traditional benefits that you articulate or have some of those be across the board, whether they are, uh, on, you know, a frontline or a part-time, it's just trying to continue to, um, I, I don't want to make it seem like all we do is say, everybody go out and, you know, spend money on your employees. It, this is just the market that we're in where the, uh, the recognition, the appreciation and, and some of the work-life balance is a, is a key piece to it, but it's an attraction and retention, um, world right now and mm -hmm. we're just trying to find the little pieces that can work for as many different businesses as, as there are right now there's going to be a ton of stuff that's in, industry specific um you know that may or may not be relevant you know i'm thinking of you know restaurants and and uh you know we you can't have a hybrid work model that I'm, you know as a waiter at a restaurant you know it's just not realistic um, or ever could happen i would imagine so, uh, yeah, I guess from a, from a general perspective, we're just trying to give the, you know, the best advice uh, and obviously it may or may not be applicable for, uh, you know, certain industries. But appreciate the questions. Yes, those were, those were good. Well, I'm going to close that and we'll, I mean, we can send the slides out, but we have plenty of like, and we have a lot of resources, whether it's flyers, it's talking about just educational pieces, um, HR handbooks, content for your employees, um, different trainings. There's, there's plenty of information out there. Um, we're happy to provide any of those documents and that's our contact info. I'm sure you can send it to. Awesome, thank you guys. Um, yeah, if you guys wanna send that to me, I can go ahead and send out to anybody who might need it. Um, those are super, everything you guys covered was just like head on to what's going on right now. And we do have a lot of businesses who call us, you know, with these concerns. So it'd be really good for us to have this material so we can send out. Um, I'd really appreciate that. Um, awesome. Well, thank you guys so, so much. I'm going to share my screen for just a minute. If you guys don't mind, um, oh. 
stopping sharing your screen. And I'm just going to go on this for a minute and just again thank our sponsors, who's MediaCom Business, BRL Human Resources, City of Coralville, City of Iowa City, and then Terry Lockridge and Dunn. Um, Dan, Ben, you guys did awesome. This was super great information. We appreciate you guys coming on. Yep. And I will go ahead and um, send everybody a link to the YouTube so you guys can watch it later, just share it out. And yeah, we're gonna, I think we're good to end the session if you guys are, Dan and Ben. Yep, that's great. Thanks for awesome. having us. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thanks.